Let's get started on this. Has anybody ever heard about Jonah? Anybody raise your hand if you've ever heard about Jonah. Okay, all right. Um, now, raise your hand if you know like the kid's story of Jonah. Like, did you learn as a kid the story of Jonah? All right, did you ever watch the Veggie Tales version of Jonah? Okay, that's a little more stylized. Okay, all right. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Some of us have heard of Jonah, some of us haven't, and that's okay. It's a story from the Old Testament. It happened uh, hundreds of years before Jesus. But it's a really neat story that most kids learn when they grow up at church because it has some really neat features to it. So what I'd like to do to start out today is just to have us together use our collective wisdom and memory and tell the story of Jonah together. If you don't know it, it's okay. Just listen and learn. Okay? So let's do it together. So we start. the story starts with a guy named... Jonah. Perfect. See, look, we're all doing well right at the beginning. A guy named Jonah. So there's a guy named Jonah, and God comes to him and tells him to do what? To go, we got to preach, to go to a city called Nineveh and tell them his message. So Jonah decides to A, listen to God, or B, disobey God. B, disobey God. He doesn't want to do it. So which direction does he go? Toward Nineveh or away from Nineveh? He goes away from it, exactly the opposite direction. And what method of transportation does he take to get there? A boat. He gets in a boat, and boats were not safe back in those days. This was a perilous journey. He gets in a boat and goes away from Nineveh. What happens when he's on the boat? There's a storm. Show me the sound. Let me hear the sound of the storm. Ready? Okay, I gotta say, this side, you're doing better than first service in this side. Really <laughs> So you already win this one. You guys are doing good too. But, so we got the storm. It's brewing. And everybody on the ship is scared. And Jonah says, it's all my fault. So you guys should do what to me? <laughs> throw me overboard. And so all the people on the boat throw Jonah overboard. And he sinks to the bottom of the sea. And we never hear from him again. No, Pastor, now that's not how the story goes. What happens? <laughs> a big fish comes and swallows him. Swallows him whole. This reminds me of that scene in Pinocchio, right? Right, where he's in the middle of fish. And so, a big fish swallows him whole, and what does Jonah do while he's inside the fish? This doesn't happen in the kid's story. He actually he prays. He, he kind of sings a song, almost, and he prays to God. And so because of that, what does the fish do? It does not spit him out. In Hebrew, in the original language, it says he barfs him out. <laughs> this is like when you learn a new language, you learn all the good words in the new language. This was the fun part in Hebrew. You get to learn the word for like for throwing up, right? The fish throws up Jonah onto the beach again. And so when Jonah's on the beach, God comes to again and says, What does God say about me? You're a terrible person. I can't believe you did that to me. You need to just go back into the sea. Is that what he says? No, what does he say? Go to Nineveh. You still got to do what I told you to do, so get going. So Jonah, does he A, go back the other way, or does he listen to God? He listens, right? He learns his lesson. He listens. He goes to Nineveh, and when he's in Nineveh, he preaches the word of God, and all the people do what? They laugh at him, they kill him, or they believe. They believe. And the whole city trusts and believes in God. That's the story, right? Except that's not the story. That's not where it ends. That's where the kid's story ends. That's where the happy ending is, right? Because Jonah finally listened. He, this is what we want to teach our kids, right? You can do something wrong, but then you have to go back and listen and obey. And when you listen and obey, everything is going to turn out okay, right? <coughs> That's the lesson we teach our kids. Is that the lesson we know as adults? Sometimes. Sometimes, but not all the time. That's the lesson we want to happen. That's the world we want to live in. That's the world we try to live in, right? We try to bring those things about. We want it to end up okay. We want to have the happy endings because we know that God gives us the ultimate happy ending. He's all about bringing goodness and hope and joy and peace in the world. That's what he says will happen at the end of time when he makes everything right again. There'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying. We know that's true. We know that's what we want. But in Jonah, that's not where it ends. And what we're going to see is that there's a whole other chapter after that where Jonah talks with God. And that talk is where a lot of the dissatisfaction, a lot of the complaining, a lot of the worry, and a lot of 
where we see our brokenness really come to the forefront. And what God has to say to that is very powerful for us today. So we're going to get there by the end of the message today where you're going to see how where Jonah is and where God is and how that really hits home for us as well. But to get there, we've got to talk about when ordinary is... How do we say that word again? Thank you. Extraordinary. All right. When ordinary is extraordinary. We know here at Crosspoint that it's about being together. It's about connection, right? Our life is best when we're connected with God. We know this. This is what we try to bring about in the world. That the things that people desire, the, the goodness that they want, the happy ending that they want, it comes with the connection with God. It's the only place we can truly find it. So the question before us today is this. Can an ordinary life be a meaningful life? Can an ordinary life be a meaningful life? I see a lot of nodding heads. That's good. That's good. Now, what happens, though, when we teach our children, when we teach that next generation, and we want them to do well in things? I was just at a soccer field yesterday with all kinds of kids and parents, and I bet that every single parent was not cheering for their kid to be the most average one on the team. Right? Go out and just be average, please. Just make an average pass. Just put in average effort. Just do an average job. That'll be great. Do you think that was happening? No, what happens when your kids put in an average effort when they're sporting events? You have to hold down that, that monologue <laughs> that, is, that is threatening to become a dialogue with your child on the field, right? And sometimes we are good at that and sometimes we are not, correct? Sometimes that dialogue comes out and the, the words come out and you speak to your children on the field. Does anybody else do this or is it just me? <laughs> no, am I alone in this? Am I really alone? <laughs> okay, all right. So, that's my problem. Um, what's that? Depends on the sport? Yeah, yeah it depends on what, you, what really you care about, right? So, the thing that we desire for the people around us and for our families, for ourselves, is not really to be average, to be ordinary. In fact, one of the things that we don't like in our current society, all the messages that we get from everything that we experience, whether it's social media, whether it's the news, whether it's our local community groups we're part of, is that we don't want to be average. We don't want to be ordinary. Ordinary is not going to get us anywhere. It's not going to help us you know, get from junior varsity to varsity. It's not going to help us get that promotion that we want at work. It's not going to help us just to be normal. An average. In fact, today there are books being written right now about how uh, the idea of being normal is almost an obscenity in our current American culture. Either you need to be the best, you need to be extraordinary, or you need to not engage at all. Right? How many followers do you have on Instagram? If your answer is not enough, you fall in this category of, I want to be the best. If your answer was zero, I heard that over there, I have zero because I do not participate in this Instagram thing about which you talk. <laughs> You've chosen to disengage, right? You want to be at the other end of that tail. Like, there's all the people in the middle with like 10 followers, and there's all the people at the end with a million, and there's everybody else with zero who says, I don't want to play this game. It's better to be one or the other, right? Nobody wants to just have 10 people follow them. Exactly, what's the point? So, this is what we carry into just about every place that we're at. Every realm that we live in. Either we want to be the best, we want to be great, or we want to just not play. Being in the middle, being normal, being ordinary, is almost a bad word. And yet, I think that some of the most ordinary things that we experience, some of the most ordinary things that we share with others, are really the things that are the most meaningful things in our lives, the things we truly, truly value. Let's see how this works out. We're going to look at Jonah's story and see how this works out for him. So let's talk about Jonah a little bit. This is how the beginning of the book starts. It says, the Lord gave this message to Jonah, the son of Amittai. So the Lord is in all caps which means that this is God's proper name coming to his people. This is the God, the one God. People used to believe in all kinds of gods. But this is the one God, the God who created all things, who 
through um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob saved his people and built the nation of Israel. This is the God. This is our Lord today. He gives a message to Jonah, who is the son of Amittai. Now, do we know who Jonah is before this book? Actually, we kind of do. Because it says son of Amittai. We find out in the book of Kings, in one of the Kings, first or second Kings, that the son of the Jonah, son of Amittai, is mentioned, and he's mentioned to be one of the prophets in one of the households of the kings. So Jonah is his patron is the king of Israel. What do you what does it say about Jonah? What do you think that means about his quality of life? Pretty good, right? He's probably at least upper middle class, if not upper class. When there's a huge lower class as well. Jonah has it good. He's safe. He's secure. He has everything that he needs. He has power. He has status. He has the ear of the king. This is Jonah. All right? God comes to him in this comfortable place and says what God always says to his people. He says, get your butts up and go. This, is, this happens all the time. Because when we get comfortable, we start to think that we are the ones that are the most important. We forget his role in our lives. He says, get up and go, and go to this great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I've seen how wicked its people are. Now, if you kind of thought earlier that Jonah disobeying God was a bad thing to do, think about what he had to do. He had to go to the city and announce judgment to all the people. Would you want to do this? Do you enjoy announcing judgment to other people? Sometimes? What if those people were people that killed your family? My name is Inigo Montoya. <laughs> the Ninevites were people who killed the Israelites. They would come in and they would come into all the cities and they would destroy the people. They were awful. They did awful things to their prisoners. They were the worst people. And yet Jonah has to go to their capital city and pronounce God's judgment to them. Which way would you want to go? Would you want to listen? This is, this is difficult. Jonah gets up and he goes in the opposite direction. To do what? To get away from the Lord. This never works out well for people, right? never works out well. He finds a ship in the port of Joppa. He buys a ticket, which isn't really probably true. Jonah was, again, very rich, right? And in those days, people didn't, there were no cruise ships. People didn't buy tickets to go on the sea because the sea was very dangerous. Many people died. They didn't take joy rides. So Jonah probably bought the ship. That's what scholars think. He was the captain, the owner of the ship. So he gets in the ship, gets a crew, and goes the opposite way towards what is modern-day Spain, all right? So Jonah has had to deal with a lot already. He's had to try to figure out who he is, what his purpose in life is, if he's going to listen to the Lord, who these Ninevites really are, and if he wants to not only go to their city but pronounce judgment upon them in the name of the Lord. It's a little more complicated than just the kid's version of the story where Jonah just disobeys his heavenly father. It's always more nuanced, isn't it? So... What does he need to have courage in? What does Jonah need to understand about the ordinariness of life in order to do this the right way? I think that one of the ordinary things that he needs to know and that we need to know today is that we're simply loved. Right? To have the courage to be ordinary means that within the depth of your soul, you know that you are loved. That no matter who you are, what you've done, what togetherness, what family you're a part of, that God loves you. Would you say that with me? Let's read. The courage to be ordinary was to say, I'm loved, right? Let's read that together. I am loved. I am loved. To know that in our depth is something that really is ordinary. Think about the first time you held a baby, whether it was yours or your sister's or brother's or somebody in your family. First time you held that baby, did you love that baby? Yeah, why? That baby couldn't do anything for you. <laughs> in fact, they made you do a lot of things. They were very demanding and very selfish. But you loved it. There's so many people that you've gotten to know that you just, you just love them. Why? Because this is something so foundational, the way that God has made us, that 
It just happens. It's not about your worthiness. It's not about what you can do for somebody else. It's about just sharing love. Because that's the first connection that God makes with us. That we are dearly and greatly loved. Does Jonah need to know this ordinary thing, or has he gotten too far past that? Has being a prophet of God and all the status and symbol and prestige that has come with that gotten in the way of this very simple, ordinary truth? That he's just somebody that is greatly and dearly loved by God. And that, it's not just him, right? Who else is greatly and dearly loved by God? The Ninevites. Even the people who are actually fighting against him are greatly and dearly loved. Do we have the courage to be ordinary? To know within ourselves how much we are loved and to see that in other people. Even in people who we don't feel like we're together with. Who are the Ninevites that you think of when that comes to mind? The people that aren't like you, that don't share the same values that you have, that don't live the same life that you do, that don't live in the same place. Are they too greatly and dearly loved by God just like you are? This is why it takes courage. Because that's a hard thing to do. It's also a very hard thing to act on. This is what Jonah found too. The next thing that's going to take in courage to do is to be able to believe this, that he is enough. Would you say that with me? I am enough. I am loved and I am enough. Now, that little baby you were holding, right, that smelled like a little baby, I mean, if you're smelling the right end of it, right, it's usually the head, the head smells good, the other end, it's got a diaper change, it's left, right, which you're going to take care of too. But that little child was enough for you, more than enough sometimes, right? The incredibleness of just that person, that unique being, they didn't have to do anything or say anything to make them be any more valuable to you than they already were. They were enough. And that's something that as we grow up, as we learn that we can do things and make things happen, that we start to lose, that we start to push down. Because other people tell us that we're not enough, right? Sometimes with a glance, sometimes with some words, sometimes with a broken relationship, they tell us we're not enough. And yet, it takes courage to know that in God's eyes, you are enough. That he has made you as his masterpiece, broken and imperfect, but enough. Jonah's got to see that. How is he going to see this? Well, all of the things happen. He gets on board the ship. There's the storm. Let me hear the storm again. That's a, that's a big storm. Thank you. Big storm. He gets thrown overboard. The big fish swallows him up. The big fish spits him out, throws him out, throws him up onto dry land. And here he is sitting on the beach when God comes to him again. The Lord spoke to Jonah, what? A second time. Our God is a God of second chances. I can't say that enough. He's a God of second chances. Maybe you thought you weren't enough the first time you tried this whole Jesus thing. But here is God again, saying, I love you, man. You are enough. Right where you are, just who I've made you to be, you are worthy. My love is here for you. He says the same thing to Jonah, who disobeys so much. <laughs> he comes back to Jonah. He says the same thing. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, deliver a message I've given you. So what does Jonah do? He obeys. He goes. He obeys the Lord's command. He goes to Nineveh, which is a huge city, the biggest in all of the land. It took three days to go into the center of it to see it all. So on the day that Jonah enters the city, he shouts to the crowds, which I kind of picture, like, how do you, you like, it's hard to see in the Bible, but like, how does he shout to the crowds? I mean, this is Jonah, right? He's going to Nineveh, he doesn't really want to be there, and yet he has this very simple message, right? Forty days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. It's like, one, two, three, four, five, eight words in English. He goes into the gates, and how do you picture him shouting to the crowds? I picture him shouting to the crowds, right? I'm kind of like, I think it's Jonah, he's like, yeah, 40 days. 40 days, going to be destroyed. Yeah, okay, whatever, I'm out. Call him. Right? Kind of that, like, basic level of obedience that teenagers will give you. That's kind of where, kind of where we're at. And yet, with these eight words, what happens? The people of Nineveh believe. This is like a preacher's dream. Eight words, only. Just eight words. And everybody believes. 120,000 people in this city 
And they all believe. They understand that this message was something that was not just from Jonah, but was from God. And from the smallest person to the most important person, they changed their ways. It says in there that the king himself of the city tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and covered himself in ashes. And as a sign of repentance, that all the people would follow his lead in praying to this God who is giving them a second chance to turn from their evil ways. And if you watch the Veggie Tales episode of this, their evilness was made known by the hitting of fish. The Ninevites were so bad they would take fish and bop people over the head with them. They were terrible. In real life, they did much worse things. 120,000 people turning to God. They got a second chance. They knew that they were loved. They knew that no matter what they had done, they were enough. They didn't have to do anything else. They just had to trust. And when God saw all of this, that they put a stop and turned around from their evil ways, he changed his mind and didn't carry out the destruction he had threatened. Now, I'm going to let that sink in just for a second. Our God is a God who knows all things, who is present in all things from the beginning to the end of time, and yet here he changes his mind. Is that strange? A little bit, maybe. Maybe not. Let it sink in for a little bit. It's a whole other sermon series. But what God does is he responds to the faith and the trust that we have. He responds to us saying, you are the Lord. And how does he respond? What does he do? Not only does he not bring destruction, but he shows mercy. He shows grace. He shows love to these dirty, awful, terrible Ninevites who really are just like Jonah. Right? Are they really any different? I am loved. I am enough. Do we have courage to not only believe those deep within ourselves, but to see that in other people. To believe that about other people with whom we do not agree or look like or live like. This was Jonah's struggle. This is not the kid's version of Jonah, right? This is something wholly other. I am loved. I am enough. What's the last thing we need to have courage? It's something that's ordinary, that should be just normal, that we know when we're young. It's this. We're not alone. Would you say that with me? I am not alone. Little kids, little babies, they know they're not alone. They need to be taken care of. They crave that connection. They're always connected with those parents, those families. And yet, as we get older, we start to lose that. And at certain points in our lives, we really do believe that we are alone. And something may have happened in your life that was very drastic that made you feel this way. There is great suffering and great brokenness that we experience here. There's no doubt about it. And we can feel like we're the only person in the world who feels this way, who's in this situation. But the promise is from God is that you are not alone. That He is with you no matter what. It's an ordinary, everyday thing. That no matter where you are, what you're doing, what your goal is, what you're working towards, that God is with you. And that he does those first two things too. That he loves you. And that you are enough for him. When we put all three of these things together, can you see how amazing of a foundation this builds in our lives? To know that we are loved, that we are enough, that we are not alone. How it forms a foundation that is strong, that can run up against some of the most difficult things that we will encounter in this world, and it will not fall. But in order to see these things, we have to have courage. We have to have courage. So Jonah had some courage. He went to Nineveh, right? He said the words. The people believed. And so that's the end of the story, right? That's the happy ending. That's where the VeggieTales version ends. That's where the Kids Stories version ends. But that's the end of chapter 3. There's still chapter 4. What happens in chapter 4? Well, let's see what happens. This change of plans, in other words, God going from destroying the Ninevites, the people who killed Jonah's family and the people he loved, to saving the Ninevites, did what for Jonah? Greatly upset him. 
and he became very angry. He complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home you would do this? That's why I ran away. Didn't I say before I left home, God, that you would be gracious and loving and wonderful and everything you promised to be? If you hear your kids say this kind of thing, what do you do? <laughs> you kind of just like throw up your hand. You're like, what is going on? Jonah is looking into himself and saying, yes, Lord, I know who you are. I know what you want. I know what you're all about. But I didn't want that. My plan was better than yours. Those Ninevites are terrible. Those other people are awful. I don't want to be together with them. I don't want you to be their Lord too. Because you're my Lord. I am loved by you. I am enough. But they're not. They're not. This is why I ran away. Just by himself again, right? Jonah's putting up all these huge barriers. He's putting up all these obstacles within himself, all these rationalizations in order to help him feel like he was right. That he knew what was true. But we can see from this that that's not really fair. It's not the way it should be. Jonah says outright, I knew you were merciful and compassionate God, slow to get anger and filled with what? Unfailing love for me, Jonah says. But I didn't want that for them. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. Seriously, does he really say this? this is in the Bible? Just kill me now, Lord. Ultimate teenager language, right? You can say it with like a Valley Girl accent, right? You can, you can hear it now. You can hear it now. But what he says is really coming from the condition of his heart when it comes to the way he looks at the people outside of himself. I would rather be dead than alive if I would have known that you would have done this. This is a huge obstacle for us. And sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we are comfortable. We know that we are loved, that we are enough for God. But then we look at other people who do other things, who look differently, who live differently, who, who are just not us. And we say, well, that can't possibly extend to them. But we know full love that God is full of great mercy, full of great love. It's these blind spots that we have. They're just so difficult. One of the things we're going to do to help us understand some of these blind spots is uh, the next few weeks we're going to read through this book together. It's called Daring Greatly. If you would like to pick up a copy, uh, we had a bunch here at first service. You should have come at 9 o'clock. I'm sorry, we're all out. We'll have some more for next week where Amazon has many, many, many copies and all kinds of versions. That's a book by Brene Brown. It's one of her earlier books, something I was skeptical of for a while, and then I actually read it. I was like, this is gold. This is amazing. Because what it does is it helps us look inside ourselves to some of the obstacles that we have that we've built up for ourselves over time. Obstacles that push us away from other people. That build up those walls that help us to see, well, to not see other people the way that God sees them. And so each week we'll go through the different chapters as we talk about the great stories that we're going to as well. And I hope that as you read this or go through it in your small group, that you can see these connections as well. This week, in that first chapter, she talks all about having courage. About how it's going to take you great courage to overcome these obstacles. But it's not about courage to do extraordinary things that the world says. It's the courage to do the ordinary things. To value love and connection and belonging more than you do anything else. It's not going to get you a promotion. It's not going to get you a million more Instagram followers. What it is going to get you is togetherness. Not just with the people you know already, with many, many, many more people. Do we have the courage to be ordinary? To know not only within ourselves that we are in love, that we are enough, that we are not alone, but to share this with people outside of ourselves, especially people who aren't just like us. Jonah, the book, ends with God talking to Jonah. 
with Jonah sitting up on a hill looking at Nineveh and how it's not destroyed, still waiting for God to destroy it, still complaining about all the goodness that God has for people. And God keeps coming back around to him saying, but Jonah, don't you see? These people are more important than your issues. These people, to have them connected with me, to have them as part together in this family, is more important than your comfort, and your status, and what you thought was right. And at the end of the book, we don't know if Jonah actually believes God or not. In fact, at the end of it, it just might be that Jonah has actually lost his faith. <laughs> We don't often get to see happy endings in real life. In the Bible, you expect it, but sometimes it doesn't happen either. What we do get to see is the goodness of God. We get to see who He is in all of His incredible love for us. We get to see how much we're loved, how much He takes us right where we are, and how much He reminds us that we will never be alone. That He will be with us through all the great times and all the terrible times. Through this, he then gives us the purpose in this world to go into all the places that we are, helping other people understand the same foundational, ordinary truths, that they too are loved, that they're enough, and that they're never alone. I pray that we get some opportunities this week to share with the people around us, that we would be encouraged within our hearts too, but that we help other people be encouraged in this as well, because it's all about being together. Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for promising us some very ordinary things that build the foundation for who we are as people and what our world, our families, our relationships are all about. That we are greatly loved, that we are enough, that we are never alone. You have made this real through your son Jesus. That he died for us, that he rose again. And it's in his worthiness, it's in his love that we approach you and that we know these truths. So Lord, bless us this day as we go into all the places that we go this week, that we would share your goodness and your love with all the people we meet. We are all in this together. Give us great courage. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.